All right. Welcome back, everyone. I am here with Gabe for our final video in this series of premature ejaculation. We are going to be talking about some strategies and ways to experiment uh, with yourself and or your partners. So let's first set the stage with a little communication, which is the most, in my opinion, the most important aspect of exploring our you know, sexuality and sexual relationships. you've watched the other videos, what we've demonstrated is that sex is extraordinarily complex while at the same time, very simple. So if you're going to try and figure out how to do that with another person, you've got to communicate about it because there's so much that can go into it. And so much that with some communication, we can figure out together to uh, have good experiences and to meet each other's interests. Absolutely. And that does require leaning into that space of vulnerability and having some courage to do that. And when you do, so much sexual freedom can arise from that experience. It just takes that first step in that direction to to actually get a taste of what that's like. Yeah. And I think it's uh, it's good for couples to like maybe even invest in uh, a dice app or, you know, something like that, that you can shake that'll do the, you know, actions and body parts, uh, because that does build some communication. And even if you don't know where to start, you know, if it says blow anus, you know, uh, with air, you know, and you're like, Ooh, I don't know if that's for me. And your partner's like, okay, well you, you could just try it for me. You know, like there's some yeah. communication that can come out of that, but I love doing this with clients and therapy, something that uh, we refer to as red light, green light, where you just rate what the sex act is for you. So if it's a red, that means it's just off the table. You're not interested. And that means it's a red for your relationship. So we don't want to try and wheedle or negotiate or, or pressure our partner into changing their reds. Um, if it's a yellow, it means, I don't, I don't know. We should communicate more about this. We should talk about what that would look like. Or if it's a green, then it's something that you're like, yeah, this is a staple for me. This is something that I'm I'm very interested in and almost in any occasion I would be willing to participate in. But if you do that, it can also be kind of a fun game where you each get to take turns bringing up a particular sex act or something. And then, you know, rating in your mind and waiting till your partner's ready and then sharing, you know, your different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I love that. Games are fun, especially if you are... Um, you're more willing to explore with your sexual menu uh, uh, by yourself and with your partner and yet just don't know how to break the ice around having that conversation. I think games are fun. They're low key. Yeah. Um, and it and certainly kind of breaks the ice. I also I'll throw in some other kind of um, fun, to fun toys. There is the skin deep. Uh, that if you've looked that up, they are a card game for relationships and couples, and they allow you to just explore your relationship deeper. And they have all sorts of different, different um, levels that you can play with. And then the other one is the Gottman card decks that has some sex yeah. questions, some love maps and other questions related to relationships and, and deepening um, your communication and, and relationship with your partner. So that's free. The Gottman the Gottman um, card decks is free and yeah. you can download that. So and we'll link all of that in, in the episode um, description in it below. So make sure you check that out. Um, what um, Gabe, I wanted to bring this up to you. Like, so communicate it's around communication, but let's say, uh, let's say I bring up, you know, the red light, green light, yellow light activity, or I want to start to introduce the conversation around, around sex, which is really hard. What if my partner just completely goes cold or um, gets defensive or says that, what am I not good enough? How, how, how can someone, because I think that's more common. I think that may be more common than we think. I think that's a lot of fear that some of us may hold to as far as like, what they're, what are they going to say? What, you know, what if they think that, you know, I don't like them or don't find them attractive or that there's a problem? How, how can we navigate that? That's, uh, such a great question. Um, the, so there are so many things to consider, but oftentimes I find that people are bringing up conversations about sex uh, based on the convenience method, which is what I like to call it, is where you've been, you've been thinking about it, or we just had sex, or we're about to have sex. And I'm sort of like, uh, 
so how would you rate feet if we were to bring those into this engagement and your partners, you know, maybe genuinely is caught off guard. It might not even be something that they're negative on, but they're just kind of like, I wasn't prepared for this conversation. And now I don't know, like if that's expected or if this whole mm-hmm. time that we've been having sex, you've been unhappy because you really wanted this other thing. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. one of the early things that I encourage people to do is to plan a conversation at a time separate from when you'd normally have sex as a possible activity. And most of us in the relationships have windows that we know sex is probably not like a, a, an activity that we're going to do right now that we could say ahead of time, Hey, you know, could we sit down and talk a little bit? I want to know more about you and your experiences in our relationship. How about Wednesday at six, you know, or like whatever it is. And, and I encourage people to actually sit at a table and to sit across from each other because, uh, Again, when we're going back to that psychology aspect, the, the, our, neuro, our neurology is engaging in that. And when I'm sitting at a table across from somebody, it's, it's a different behavior than when I'm sitting on the couch you know, casually. So if we formalize it a little bit, it helps us to recognize this as a conversation that we're having rather than sort of a, maybe I don't want to have this conversation right now. And so I'm just going to turn the TV on or whatever. Right. Get some snacks. <laughs> right. So it formalized a little yeah. bit. Yeah, um, yeah. And so that can help. The other thing is I encourage partners to remember that these conversations aren't easy for everyone. And you might have to bring it up again at another time. And your partner will get potentially more comfortable as you approach them with, care and uh, empathy for their position that they, they might be more willing to talk about it over time. So you still might have to bring some of these things up again in the future in order to have the conversation you're looking to have. Absolutely. And it's a process folks. Like it's not a microwave process. It's a crock pot process <laughs> where you're just, you're, you're letting things simmer that we, every single person has their way of integrating and processing certain situations and experiences, both emotional and physical. And so just be like, you're saying, Gabe, be patient, be compassionate towards one another. Um, and, and just hold that safe space for one another that you're turning towards each other as uh, very, McCarthy would say as erotic allies and not enemies. And so they think that's just really important. I'm so glad we're having this conversation to communicate (laughs) to folks on how to really improve their sex lives with themselves and with their partners, partner, Mm -hmm. partners. So, so important. Um, Let's segue to, so we we talked a lot about the uh, relational, emotional aspects of, of communication, but what about body mapping and, and again, nonverbal communication and touch and, and all the feels let's talk about body mapping. Yeah. So it's, um, that also has, it's uh, an interesting crossover with in the pieces of all the other things, right? So there are different ways that you can do this. Sometimes I do work with couples to communicate with their nonverbals in ways that they've identified that they've actually communicated about ahead of time so that, Uh, because some people are uncomfortable with using their words while in a sexual engagement. So some of that can be even just when I do this, or when I make this move, my partner knows that this is what I'm asking for next, or this is what, you know, I'm hoping for, but also in that body mapping where we talked about getting to know your own body and what feels good and what produces pleasure. And also meaning like, if I'm trying to make an engagement last a little bit longer on my end, maybe I'm avoiding or not doing certain Mm -hmm. things that I know produce more pleasure. So sometimes you can select a position that doesn't stimulate you as much, but that does more for your partner. And that can be a part of knowing what they like and what you like and mapping those things can help you as a couple uh, figure out how to do that. The other part that I do with couples is coaching. So when you know your body and when you're at a place where you're willing to communicate about it, I'll have couples do a coaching session outside of their regular sexual routine. So it's not a part of a a sex act in the sense that we are um, maybe seeking the mutuality that we'd normally seek or whatever. One Mm -hmm. partner takes the lead and they coach on what their body mapping is. And so their partner, it might be oral sex that they're coaching on. And so they will be engaging in something sexual for one partner, 
but it's a time that I have permission to say, well, if you could do it more like this, or maybe get your hand involved like this, or let me show you, then it helps my partner understand better what my body feels and what feels good to me. And then when we have an engagement in the future, you've got, you know, a background, you've been coached, you know, what works. And so we want partners to do that for each other. Absolutely. Oh, I like using the analogy with a, an itch. Like if I have an itch on my back and I want my partner to scratch it, I have to be able to move my body in a certain way, verbally communicate, non-verbally communicate to say, no, go lighter, go harder, go softer, get your nails into it, whatever, right? Yeah. Like go up, go yeah. down. I mean, and those are all what I'm hearing you say as far as this body mapping and coaching and being able to first discover what feels good for oneself and then be able to confidently and securely be able to do that with your partner and know that your partner has your back um, no matter what, you know, with no matter what. Right. So I think that's so important. That's great. I I also think like, you know, I I sometimes tell, um, you know, my clients, like just even touching your own body in a way that's non-performative, like, touching other parts of your body, not just your penis, and then slowly going to the penis to if there is any type of hypersensitivity around the glands or the shaft or anywhere in the penis, that we can kind of um, resensitize that area again, based on, you know, breath work, slowing things down, being mindful, exploring with different types of touch or stroke or pressure or vibration. And, and again, because that's just going to help you be able to coach your partner in, in what, what feels good for you and what triggers, um, more excitement, more, you know, build up quicker than you'd like. And so you're almost creating this, um, pacing, uh, for yourself, like you're pacing, but you're also not pacing in a, Oh, I, I feel like sometimes when we introduce certain activities, it's so, um, rigid, you know, like this is an exercise or an activity that I have to do. And it's like a chore. No, it's, it's really just about, you know, leaving the performance aside, but just really getting to know your body in a more introspective way um, without any expectations. I think that's the, the, the most challenging for a lot of folks. There's no expectations around the coaching or the, the self-touch, genital stimulation, masturbation, um, guided masturbation or meditative masturbation. There's no expectation around that. Um, it's just an experience and that you're willing to explore and entertain that experience to gain some insight. Totally. Yeah. And I think that crosses into, and you've mentioned some of this, just that like the mindfulness as a part of that approach. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap between body mapping and mindfulness. Um, oftentimes mindfulness is thought of as paying attention to your senses and just living in your moment. And so some of that isn't performative necessarily. It's just about uh, experiencing what your body sensations are and what your, you know, your nervous system is capable of communicating. I love to tell people to explain to me how their pants feel on their knees, you know, like, cause uh, how do you, how do you use words to explain that to someone else, but yeah. your brain can feel it. And, and you can like sort of sit there and like explore that. And it can actually take a lot of time to just explore how your pants feel on your knees. Um, and so, yeah, being, being there and mindful with our bodies can help us both to body map, but also to do that relaxation. That's so important when we're talking about the physical considerations of relaxing so that I'm not pushing or pressuring my body to where it's hurrying up with pushing out the, you know, ejaculate or anything like that to where I'm, you know, having premature ejaculation. Right. Exactly. So let's um, talk about some of the pragmatic um, uh, strategies or experiments that we can use around like barrier methods and um, start stop technique, which is a very commonly um, shared uh, strategy for, for folks with PE. Let's talk about those. Yeah. So um, I think in some ways, um, there's been some entanglement with some other pieces of like sexual pleasure with the start, stop or resting. And, and sometimes it's referred to as edging. And so edging itself can be a part of uh, someone's love map or their pleasure template. And they like to come right to their point of no return and stop, or even try and prevent that from continuing, which we talked about, if you're dealing with PE can actually, you know, make that worse in some ways. Mm -hmm. 
So when we're talking about start, stop and resting, I don't think that a lot of people realize that we're not saying go until you think you're about to come and Mm -hmm. then stop. I mean, we're saying like, get, get some practice, do some movement and go ahead and stop and see that you're okay and feel that feeling and, and be in that mindful state. And then maybe when you feel ready, you can start back up and that can be done you know, with yourself, it can be done with a partner that you communicated with that they can do some of that and you can ask them to stop and they understand, you know, what's going on in that process. Uh, and resting is sort of a, a similar way, or maybe another way sometimes to talk, talk about start, stop. Sometimes when we think of uh, start, stop, you might think withdrawal. So if you're mm-hmm. penetrative, whatever you're doing, then we're talking about withdrawing, um, with resting, you're not necessarily withdrawing. Um, whatever that is, even if it's oral sex, you might just be resting. But again, that's not going to work if you've gone all the way to your edge or to your point where you can't stop. Resting is uh, not going to help you get better. You're going to miss out on some of the pleasure that you could experience if you've already passed that point. Right, right. And I will pull in the pelvic muscles again, how body awareness, mindfulness of the physical body tension, um, uh, ass gripping, abdominal, um, you know, gripping, um, you know, just really adding in that tension, that buildup, that is also providing sensory signaling to the nerves in this area to activate and get more excited. So I think it's important to when you're doing this start, stop or resting that you're really bringing that mindfulness piece in and you're softening your body, which is going to be, it's going to change the rigidity. It may change the rigidity of your erection. And I think that's, that is completely normal and healthy and that it's expected. So please don't freak out when that happens. (laughs) Um, So a little disclaimer there, but just know that you're you're basically, you're training, you're getting new pathways, you're getting more experience in um, getting to know your body and then sharing that experience with your partner. And so, um, yes, pelvic muscles, definitely being more aware of not really squeezing. There's going to be some tension there. I mean, it's impossible to even just like, how do we assess tension? You know, it's how you feel. I mean, you know how much tension is in your body. It's like, if I said, go ahead and, and make a fist, you do this. But if I said, go ahead and just close your hand, you're going to do it a little differently, right? It's right. not just going to be like, right. You can, you can still do the same motion. I still have the same motion and the same movement just with a different intensity. So what I'm saying is go in and at it with a relaxed intensity. Right. <laughs> so, um, um uh-huh. some of the other pragmatics, right. Being talking a little bit about barriers, yeah. uh, because sometimes, uh, part of what creates either a physical or a psychological um, trigger, you know, can be what we're believing is happening while engaging. So it might be that the sensations are, you know, really intense on the glands or on the penis. Mm-hmm. It could be that the psychology of uh, having someone touch a bare penis or penetrating without a condom or something like that can also hit some of those triggers. So tell me about like, in your mind, adding barriers as a, a thing that we could do. Yes. So there has been use of Prilocaine, which is a cream. It's like a numbing agent um, that folks can try um, to, but that at that same token, right, it's a numbing agent. So it's also going to diminish the overall sensory experience that you have. Um, and then making sure that, you know, again, if you're with a partner and there's going to be any type of penetrative in, or intercourse that, you know, you're realizing like what the impacts are going to be on that person with that cream, making sure that it's completely absorbed into your skin so that your partner is not kind of receiving that same numbing agent. Um, but so yeah, there's, there's pros and cons to that, but some folks have found it very helpful, um, in their situation. So, um, prilocaine and then, um, condoms, you know, using condoms, decreasing the sensitivity, um, as far as a barrier method, um, Gabe, I don't know if you have any other like actual physical barrier methods. Um, I think, I think people maybe don't think to use that barrier of a prophylactic, Mm -hmm. except when they're thinking about penetrative sex. And then there might be, they might say, okay, well, I'll use a barrier now and maybe that'll help me, you know, not orgasm so fast, but like Mm -hmm. 
if you have an erection, you can have a prophylactic on Mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of things that you can be doing during this process to have fun. So hand stimulation, oral stimulation, um, using your penis to stimulate your partner somewhere externally. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's some mutuality that you can get into with a partner about how that using that barrier, that prophylactic can be, uh, helpful, um, in your relationship. Now, when we're talking about deadening the sensations, right? So we don't want to, you don't layer those, you don't get more condoms to, you know, deaden the sensation more or anything like that, because they, they are not meant to be used more than one at a time. Mm -hmm. However, you could have your partner wear some sort of layer. So maybe they keep their underwear on and you have a layer on. And so if you're doing some of this to build um, your uh, your sense of your own body and understanding of what feels good and doesn't feel good, you can have some of those other physical or even psychological triggers of a a naked bottom or, you know, in front Mm -hmm. of you that you can reduce some of that during your um, engagement with your sexual partner by having them have a layer on or something. Mm -hmm. And you might still use a prophylactic for some of that external or hand or oral stimulation. Right. Right. And some folks, uh, when I mentioned serotonin in our previous episode, there are some folks have used, um, SSRIs like serotonin, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, you know, in the class of antidepressant medication, I know there's a stigma, you know, unfortunately the stigma around that, but uh, we won't get into that. Um, but so those have been used to help um, prolong or let decrease the um, ejaculatory process or how quick it happens. So um, that has been used from a medical perspective as well. And again, some folks do really well with that and others just don't because there are side effects that come along with those medications, especially around desire, um, sexual appetite, and also just getting an erection and sustaining an erection. So uh, it's really about dose pacing. Everyone is a unique individual and all these um, strategies and recommendations should be tailored to your unique individual needs and that of your coupleship. So it's really important that you kind of take that into to consideration because um, what, what worked for some pers- one person, is, it may not work for you. Um, And it's the exploration process, the experimentation process that allows you to determine what ingredients or what recipe works for you the best. Right. It doesn't have to be your very first attempt. Everything's perfect. I love the idea of testing your hypothesis and reevaluating and setting a new hypothesis and testing that new one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Gabe, I thoroughly enjoyed doing this very special series with you. Thank you so much. Um, And to all of our listeners and viewers there, thank you so much for being here. We hope you found it helpful. All of our contact information will be in the YouTube description below, the video description below. So check if you liked uh, this series, please like, like this video and our videos. And also be sure to subscribe because there is a lot more yumminess um to come no pun intended <laughs> and, and um yeah definitely we, we look forward to um chatting with you all again so thank you so much and gabe thank you again for being here thanks for the invite